Leaning back in my chair, I looked around the room and thought about the presence of so many amazing women. Why did Marc Lavalier choose my wife? Why did she agree? Why did she decide to leave me? When our children grew up and became more independent, and their absence was approaching, Linda and I were already discussing our plans for the period when they would not be at home. Some time ago, I had a fleeting thought about the possible dynamics of my relationship with Linda. I assumed that we would have the opportunity to talk and get closer, but suddenly realized that Linda's plans for the future might not concern me. I felt stupid, and my frustration turned into anger, which was visible on the worried faces of the people around me. Anger overshadowed my sadness, and it felt like my head was about to explode. D asked nervously, Jim, are you okay? You look like you're going to do something really stupid. As she spoke, four attractive young women were sitting at a table at the opposite end of the dance floor, and they could be seen over Dee's shoulder. I couldn't help but wonder why Marc Lavalier didn't choose one of them. After watching the group of ladies for a minute, I suddenly burst into loud laughter. Everyone at the table looked at me in alarm, as my laughter attracted the attention of other customers. My laughter was so strong that people started turning around and looking at our table. Tears were streaming down my face, and I was laughing uncontrollably. When the laughter died down, I wiped my tears and smiled broadly at everyone around me. And then it dawned on me that my life had taken a sharp turn. I was no longer married, and the burden of caring for my wife's feelings was lifted from my shoulders, as well as from hers. All eyes were on me as I took off my wedding ring and handed it to Dee with a feeling of amazement. Give it to Linda when you see her, I said. I got up and put a $10 bill on the table. This is for my drink, I said, feeling a surge of anger at the person who pushed Linda to cheat. Since you've been so supportive of her actions, you can pay the bill. As I was walking away from the table, my former friends called out to me. As I left the club, I wondered what I would say if they tried to follow me. All I knew for sure was that if any of the husbands ignored my warning and followed me, I would not hesitate to defend myself. When I went out into the night, my head was full of thoughts, and I knew that Linda was going to start a night of selfish indulgences. I planned to indulge in selfish fun alone. Arriving at the hotel, I asked the girl at the reception about the availability of full-size rooms. She informed me that there were none, but offered a honeymoon suite as an alternative. She explained in detail about the various amenities included in the room, and explained that the room I am currently in cannot be rented as it was late at night. I decided to book a room for the newlyweds, and offered to pay for both rooms. My wife will live in a standard room, and I will live in a suite. The receptionist gave me a puzzled look, then handed me a room key card and gave me instructions. I assured her that my wife should not have access to my room, and asked that no one inform her of my presence at the hotel if she was interested. A puzzled expression and a smirk appeared on the girl's face. She said that the hotel staff would be informed of my needs. After going to my previous room, I packed my things and threw all of Linda's clothes and belongings in the trash. Taking the elevator to the top floor, I entered a spacious honeymoon suite with a jacuzzi on a spacious balcony with stunning views of the city. I bought an expensive tuxedo, looking forward to a late night with a drink at a trendy restaurant. I put on my jacket, looked into the ATM, and then returned to the club. Arriving at the place, I found a long queue at the entrance. Confidently approaching the doorman, I handed him a hundred-dollar bill with a smile. In response, he opened the door for me, allowing me to enter as if I were a VIP guest. When I entered the club, I noticed my former friends sitting at a table. Looking around, I looked for something familiar, and noticed a table near the dance floor with four stunning young girls who were clearly celebrating some kind of bachelorette party. Since there were no men in sight, I saw an opportunity. Casually strolling through the club, Dee noticed me and tried to get my attention. Ignoring this, I continued on my way, and I happened to come up to a table with four ladies. Why are four beautiful ladies sitting all alone? They all smiled at me. 
The tall brunette grinned and explained. We're here to support our friend. Her ex left her for someone else and we're here to cheer her up. Having obviously drunk a little, the brunette continued. I'd like you to dance with our friend and help cheer her up if you don't mind. I turned to the petite red-haired girl, ready to make her evening a little brighter. Smiling, she held out her hand for me to help her out of the table. When we went out on the dance floor, I asked her name, to which she replied that it was Samantha. I introduced myself as Jim and couldn't help but wonder how someone could miss such an amazing woman. Because he's a bastard, she replied with a grin. We chatted while we danced and found out that she was studying to be a nurse and had grown up in the area. When one song ended and a slower melody started, we continued dancing. The music was playing softly when Samantha asked, Jim, are you married? I shook my head. We broke up. Then she asked, Was it your wife who danced with Marc Lavalier? I noticed that she disappeared after that dance. I nodded in agreement. Everyone at the club noticed it, Jim. I tried to give Samantha my best smile. I think you found out about your breakup at the same time I did. Samantha smiled warmly back at me, and we danced in a tight circle until the song ended. We had both recently gone through heartache over a loved one, so the comfort of each other's arms was encouraging for us. When the song ended, we returned to Samantha's table. Samantha surprised everyone by inviting me to join them, despite the fact that they had agreed in advance that the company would be exclusively female. The brunette at the table was playfully teasing us, questioning Samantha's decision. To make amends, I offered to buy some bottles of champagne for their company. I don't know, but a deal is a deal, Samantha said with a smile. We saw Marc Lavalier leaving with your wife, she added. All three women said with one voice, What a horror. When they made room for Samantha and me, one of the blondes asked, Do you have an open marriage? I answered hastily, No way. Then the other blonde asked, What did she tell you about it? To which I simply replied, Nothing. She informed me that she went to the bathroom and then left with Mark through the back door of the club. Without looking back, I made a thumb gesture and continued, All my old friends who were jerks had her back. At that moment, the waitress came over. I asked if everyone liked champagne and everyone smiled. Bring us two bottles of your best champagne, I asked. The girls nodded approvingly. Before they could ask, I introduced myself. Kim, Christy, and Susan, as well as Samantha, studied to be nurses. While they were toasting with champagne, brunette Christy asked about my plans for my wife. I explained that we had already broken up when she left. When I was asked about the children, I told them that I have a son and a daughter, aged 15 and 13. In a few years, they will become more independent, and I will think about finding my own partners. Samantha grabbed my hand and exclaimed, To hell with it! You're going to be with me today! We all raised our glasses and drank champagne. I shared a couple of jokes with the girls, and they, in turn, shared a few with me. Laughter filled the air as we continued to drink and have fun. The girls took turns dancing with different guys and with each other, and Samantha stayed next to me, hugging me. When the evening was coming to an end, Christy suddenly got upset, jumped up from her seat at the table, and ran away. Everyone quickly turned their heads to see where she was going. Dee decided to come over to me, but Christy intercepted her at the table of my former friends. Although we couldn't hear their conversation, it was clear that they were discussing something violently. The situation escalated when Christy began aggressively pushing Dee in the chest while shouting in her face. As a result, Dee burst into tears and retreated to her seat. After that, Christy began to swear at everyone present at the table, as a result of which the surrounding people burst into loud laughter. After her return, Kim and Susan congratulated Christy with a high five. Christy took a sip of champagne, smiled at me and said, None of these fools will come to our table for the rest of the evening. I looked at their table and saw that they were all getting up to leave. Both Jane and Dee seemed to be in tears, but neither of them even looked in our direction. What did you tell them, Christy? I asked. 
She explained that she had seen a woman who was gathering the courage to approach us, so she quickly pushed her away and made it clear that they were vile personalities and had betrayed their friend. You made an impression on me. It was obvious that they hoped that I would forgive Linda to calm myself down. Should I kiss you for that? Samantha grabbed my head and said, You won't have to. And then she kissed me passionately on the lips while the other girls cheered her on. After the kiss, Samantha smiled warmly at me. Kim jokingly said, Find yourself a room, you two. I replied, Actually, I have a hotel room nearby, and you ladies don't seem to need to go. If we hurry, we can still get the champagne to the room, I suggested as we left the bar. Samantha held on to my hand, and the others leaned on her and supported us as we walked towards the hotel. At the reception, I asked to bring four bottles of champagne to my room. When I mentioned that my room was a honeymoon suite, the ladies couldn't help but laugh. As we were going up in the elevator, three women started singing the wedding march. Samantha blushed deeply, but clung to me even more tightly. When we reached the entrance to the hall, the women jokingly suggested that I carry the bride over the threshold. Samantha, with captivating eyes, assured me that this was not necessary. Deciding to play along, I opened the door, pulled Samantha off her feet, and carried her inside. Once in the room, Samantha hugged me and bit into my lips with a passionate kiss. The women laughed at our antics until Christy pointed to the jacuzzi on the balcony. Before I could get Samantha to sit down, all three of them were already in bras and panties and warming up in the jacuzzi. I gently lowered Samantha to the floor, where she took my hand and smiled. At that moment, there was a knock on the door, and champagne was brought to our room. We brought champagne to the ladies who were laughing and joking together. Susan playfully remarked that I was too dressed and I needed to undress too. I smiled sheepishly and explained that I was just keeping Samantha company. Samantha was invited to join the others in the jacuzzi, but instead she smiled and led me back to the room. As we walked to the bridal room, her friends performed the wedding march from the balcony, and their laughter filled the air. The next morning, I woke up to Samantha snuggling next to me, and three other women were sprawled out on the double bed, all of them undressed. It looks like they joined us after Samantha and I fell asleep. Slipping out of bed quietly, I caught Samantha's eye. She returned my smile with her own. Did you have a good time, Jim? What is it? She asked. Yes, it was the best night of my life. Come take a shower with me, Samantha said, pulling me out of bed and into the bathroom. Wanting to experience something new, I picked her up in my arms and sat her on my lap, standing in the shower. I pinned her against the wall, and she wrapped her legs around me. It wasn't easy to maintain a standing position, but the intense pleasure I was experiencing was worth it. It was one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life. Samantha has already peaked twice, making a lot of noise. After getting out of the shower, we realized that our passionate process had woken up the other women in the house. Despite the hangover, they looked cheerful, ordered room service and sipped cocktails. Christy jokingly said, I can't wait to get in that shower. You two presented him as the best shower in the world. Laughter filled the room, and Samantha and I exchanged knowing glances. After everyone took their places in the shower, everyone left except Samantha, who asked if I would give her a ride home. As we drove, she leaned against me to comfort me. Jim, I understand that your wife did a terrible thing, but you can still make peace with her, she said. And if not, then I'll be glad to see you again. Samantha's hopeful smile warmed my heart. I would really appreciate it, Samantha. I have no plans to reconcile with my ex-wife right now. It was a pleasure to spend time together. You're exactly what I need right now, so call me if you think we can be together. I kissed Samantha on the doorstep. When she opened the door, I saw Christy sitting on the couch, smiling and waving at me. As soon as I left, the weight of deciding what to do with Linda was still hanging in my head. Returning to the club in response to Linda's betrayal was impulsive, but it brought some relief. When I returned home, 
I collapsed into a chair in the dimly lit living room, preoccupied with thoughts about how to end a failed marriage with minimal consequences for my children. After a while, I can't say exactly how long, my attention was attracted by the sound of a car approaching the house, and then the familiar sound of a key turning in the lock. Jim! Jim! I'm home! came her voice, unlike the one she usually used when returning from work. When she closed the front door and turned on the light, I turned around and saw that she was standing still and looked the same as always. She was still wearing the blue dress she had worn the night before. Her dark hair cascaded down her back in the same way. Rings adorned her shoulders, face, and fingers. Everything looked unchanged, as if nothing had happened. Despite the fact that she spent the night and morning betraying me with another, there were no visible changes in her appearance. I couldn't believe it. There should have been at least some sign of guilt or shame, but she just smiled softly and said, It's just me, as old as ever. She understood my thoughts perfectly. Everything remained unchanged, absolutely unchanged. My feelings for you are as strong as they were yesterday. I wish I could say the same about myself. As I said this, I couldn't help but notice how cold and detached my words sounded. Jim! With a blank expression on her face, she gestured towards our bedroom where she was standing. Don't even think about it. Go take a shower. Linda finally left. After the shower, she came back downstairs and asked, Jim, where are my clothes from last night? I replied, I think she's still in the hotel room where you left her. I didn't bring your stuff home. She looked surprised. Linda looked like she was going to criticize me for not paying attention, but instead she fell silent, realizing how incredibly stupid it would sound. Why did you do that, Linda? I asked. Linda sighed. Mark was rich and famous, he could choose any woman. When he asked her to dance the night before, she felt like the most desirable girl in the room. He made her feel special, and the memories of that moment still haunt her. As she spoke, I noticed that she was no longer focused on our conversation, immersed in memories of the previous night with Marc Lavalier. At that moment, I realized that this was the end. Linda's heart will always cherish the time spent with him, and I will remain just a note. When I asked if she loved him, she denied it, claiming it was only a physical desire. She confessed her love for me, but it was clear that our definitions of love and relationship to a partner were radically different. Linda's surprised expression showed her self-esteem, and I realized that I was too sensitive because of my wounded ego. It was unpleasant for me to see her destroying my ego in order to raise her own. I came back to you because I really love you. I asked Linda if she would have stayed with him if Mark had asked her to stay and become his girlfriend or wife. After a moment's hesitation, she replied, Of course not, I love you, Jim. But I couldn't help but notice her initial hesitation. I understand the meaning of this look. If he had asked you to stay, you wouldn't have refused. It was just one night. It was just a physical encounter. The conversation is closed. I need time to think about it. Please pack the essentials for yourself and the children and go to your parents for the whole week. But Jim... The conversation is closed. If you really want to resolve the issue immediately, then given my current emotions, you may not achieve the desired result. This time there was anger in my tone and demeanor. Linda packed up her things and left. After she disappeared from sight, I wasted no time and put my plan into action. When I saw Linda in a familiar blue dress at the entrance to the house, I realized that in order to cope with this, I needed to change something. I quickly begged two weeks off from my boss, rented a truck, and bought everything I needed from a hardware store, including wood, drywall, paint, and two exterior doors. When I got home, I packed up my tools and immediately started putting my idea into practice. I started by dismantling the front door and the windows around it. When a large opening was formed, I installed two new entrance doors the old one on the right, and the new one on the left. Then I built a wall in the center of the house, 
right at the main entrance, and install drywall. I was planning to create a duplex. On the left side where the new kitchen will be, I installed a new door. The kitchen was supposed to be located opposite the living room, as well as on the other side. The study turned into the third bedroom on my side of the duplex, and the dining room became the third bedroom on Linda's side. After the renovation was completed, both sides of the duplex looked almost the same, with the only difference being that there was a separate garage on Linda's side. In the future, I plan to build another garage on my side. To ensure my privacy and security, I changed the lock and code on the garage door so that only I could access it. I also installed a fence in the backyard to make it more private. I split the backyard in half to make a duplex. I called the kids every day and told them I was busy working on the house. Linda tried to talk to me, but I wasn't in the mood to listen to her. A few days later I called Samantha, just to hear her voice and hope to spend more time with her. She expressed concern that I had forgotten about her, but I assured her that I did not stop thinking about her. She playfully asked if I was going to ask her out, to which I replied, I'm not asking you out, but I thought we could go away for the weekend together. How about a trip to the Bahamas? Will you be able to leave on Thursday and come back on Tuesday? Yes, let's do it. Just take your phone and passport with you. We can buy everything you need upon arrival. After we enthusiastically discussed our plans, I had to say goodbye to arrange a flight and a hotel. A spontaneous trip to the Bahamas is, of course, a waste. But why not? If Linda decides to leave me, she will receive half of our savings and my salary for child support. I couldn't help but chuckle at the thought that Linda seemed to be financing half of the trip with Samantha. To be safe, I transferred our savings to a bank account exclusively in my name and redirected my salary there. I doubted Linda would cancel the credit card, but just in case, I wanted to make sure I had access to the money. I spent 16 hours every day to finish all the walls, although some areas still needed finishing touches. By Wednesday, I managed to finish and paint the central wall on Linda's side. I knew that eventually I would have to separate electricity, gas, and water. But so far Linda had the same gas and electricity on her side as mine. This meant that Linda couldn't turn off the utilities on my side. On Wednesday evening, I asked Linda to bring the kids home the next morning. On Thursday morning I closed my part of the house and settled on a chair outside, looking forward to their arrival. When they drove up in the car and got out of it, all of them standing on the lawn in front of the house seemed to be in a state of shock. Emma broke the silence first. Dad, what have you done? I proudly announced that I had turned our house into a duplex. It was clear from their confused expressions that they were not as enthusiastic about the changes as I was. I assured them that I had finished arranging their new rooms on the right side of the house, hoping to allay their fears. While I was giving the children a tour of the left side of the new house, Linda kindly took their bags to the rooms. Their eyes widened in surprise at the size and layout of the house. After examining the different rooms, we gathered in the living room on the right side of the house. Tommy spoke up, expressing his concern about the small size of the living room. I assured him that we would soon add a garage on the other side of the house, as well as a swimming pool and jacuzzi. This news brought smiles to the faces of the children. Linda told the children to start unpacking their suitcases. She gave me a look that said she wanted to talk to me, but I preferred to focus on the children, helping them organize their things and making sure they had everything they needed. As soon as they were settled, I bought sandwiches at a nearby store and we all sat down at the kitchen table to have lunch. Emma asked, Dad, what's going on? But her attention was mainly focused on Linda's reaction. After spending the last few days with Linda, Emma and Tommy clearly felt that something was wrong and that their mother was evading their questions. We are getting closer to becoming empty nests. I am beginning to accept that everything will change. I am preparing for this. Hey, Dad. Maybe you should have talked to us before making such decisions. Actually, it was mom's idea. 
She said she feels it's time for a change and she needs a new direction. I looked at Linda with a smile, and she looked surprised. Emma asked, Mom, why did you decide to make such a big change without talking to us first? Tommy chimed in, Yeah, don't you care what we think? Linda looked puzzled. It was just a misunderstanding. Your father didn't understand how I really feel, she explained. I'm not sure, dear. Your intentions were clear from the very beginning. As soon as I saw how determined you were, I knew there was no turning back. With a pained expression on her face, Linda left the room on the verge of tears. Tommy asked a question about her recent behavior, asking out loud why she cries so often. In response, I just shrugged my shoulders, advising them to ask their mother. Before Emma could ask another question, I informed them that I had planned a trip out of town and I would be gone for a few days. I assured them that although I would not be in touch during the trip, I would definitely call them every evening. I gave them a quick kiss on the head and headed for the door, wondering if they'd noticed that I hadn't said goodbye to their mom who was in the bedroom. Then I picked Samantha up from her apartment and we went on an adventure. It was truly one of the greatest moments of my life. We traveled first class, stayed at a luxurious five-star resort, and were treated like royalty, enjoying a weekend filled with sun, sand, waves, delicious food and drinks. Even better, Samantha was constantly thanking me and trying to show how much she appreciated that I was with her. When our time together came to an end, we both got a deep tan, and I memorized every detail of Samantha's amazing physique. On Tuesday, when I drove Samantha to her apartment, she kissed me passionately at the front door. Would you like to spend another night with me? To which I replied, I would love to agree, but you have classes tomorrow. Please call me before going to bed. I want to hear your voice before I fall asleep, I whispered with a smile, kissing her goodbye. As I drove home, I couldn't help but grin at the thought of Samantha admitting she might fall in love with someone like me. As I drove up to my house, I noticed Linda's car in the driveway and decided to park on the street to avoid her. When I was unloading my things, I was startled by a knock on the door. It was Linda. You're here, she said. Yes, I'm here. Can we talk? I asked, not knowing what to expect. What topic would you like to discuss? May I come in? No, you're not allowed to be on my side. I'll explain that this is my private living room and you can't be on this side. Never. Linda, visibly surprised, gave me a brief glance and then headed back to her room. Now it became clear that I would not live on her half of the duplex. We were both sitting at her kitchen table. Jim, you are very dear to me, and I would like everything to go back to normal. Unfortunately, this is not possible. Why? Because if you haven't figured it out yet, you did something that changed my feelings for you forever. This is a difficult situation. In fact, everything is correct. What I have done cannot be undone and my emotions about it will not change. But I still have to say that I still love you. Let's imagine that we were at a meeting with friends. I left you to be with someone else and spent the whole night and the next morning with her in an intimate atmosphere. If I had behaved like this on our first date, would there have been a second chance? But Jim, it was Mark. I don't care who it was. You chose someone else, not me. Jim, I'm trying to explain that I didn't choose Mark over you. So it wasn't you who decided to leave through the back door of the club? Didn't you decide to have an intimate relationship with Mark Lavalier? It was just one night. You've had your whole life to show me how much you care about me. Whenever a more famous person approached you, I felt insignificant. Does this mean that I had to protect you from communicating with all famous athletes, actors, and politicians? There will be a marathon this weekend. Are you planning to have an intimate relationship with the winner? Jim, this is unfair. I said calmly. Now you want justice. You want to be able to downplay your betrayal. An opportunity to discuss my anger over your actions. An opportunity to make me feel guilty for being betrayed. The opportunity to criticize me for the fact that our family is not more important to you than my own emotions. 
It feels like only I am expected to understand in this relationship. I reached out and took her hand across the table. She smiled and gently squeezed my hand with both of hers. When I looked into Linda's eyes, I knew I was going to hurt her. Linda had to figure out how our relationship would develop in the future. And deep down I longed to see her reaction. Linda, it's too late, I said sadly. Too late for what? What do you mean? What is it? She asked, her voice filled with despair. I found another one, I confessed. Linda recoiled, pulling her hands away from mine as if they were on fire. Do you know who this is? I asked, already knowing the answer. I'm sure Dee and your friends have already told you about the redhead I danced with that night after you left. The one who hugged me while we were dancing. About the woman who replaced you at the anniversary you ran away from. When the accusations of betrayal and abandonment reached her ears, I looked into Linda's mournful gaze. It dawned on me that Dee had most likely shared photos of Samantha and me in a close embrace, which caused Linda to feel hurt and betrayed. Blushing with anger, Linda questioned whether my actions were a deliberate attempt to get back at her. She accused me of using a younger woman, Samantha, as a means to hurt her, and I told her that I had spent four days with her in the Bahamas. Do you remember that amazing vacation I always talked about? It was really unforgettable. I couldn't help but smile when I mentioned it, despite the reaction it caused Linda. My words seemed to anger her, and the smirk on my face only made the situation worse. I quickly pulled myself together, took a deep breath and forced my expression to become neutral. Linda's eyes were burning, ready to vent her anger on me, but when she met my satisfied grin, she hesitated. I could see the disappointment in her expression as she tried to find the right words. Eventually, she took a deep breath, pulled herself together, and put her hand on the table. We sat in silence and looked into each other's eyes when she realized that her anger had lost its power over me. It was obvious that she wanted to scold me to teach me a lesson, but deep down, she knew that she had no good reason for this. The dynamics of our relationship have always been based on love and trust, which gave her a sense of power and influence. But she decided to throw it all away for a fleeting moment of passion with Mark. It was only later that Linda realized the true cost of her act. Perhaps she thought that by sleeping with Mark, she would spend only a small part of the emotional currency that she had accumulated during our marriage. Linda finally began to suspect that she had foolishly risked everything. Sitting in silence, she stared at her hands clasped tightly on the table. It doesn't matter. I love you, she said softly. Yes, you may still believe that your love matters, but why should I appreciate it after what you've done? It's clear that my love doesn't mean anything to you, so why should yours matter to me? Despite everything, she added, but I don't want to lose you. I can't understand how you could believe that you could undermine my trust and keep me by your side. You used me to your advantage, and now you don't have my love. Linda looked puzzled. I'm going back to my house. There's still a lot of work at home. I'll be back for dinner with you and the kids. Please don't bother me until then. I got up and went to my apartment. Linda was crying when I left, and the pain of parting with her became unbearable. I wanted to hug her like I used to, but I knew that our relationship would never be able to return to its previous state. The woman I once knew as my wife is gone and will never come back. Every moment of communication with her now served as a painful reminder of what could have been destroyed by her thoughtless actions. Before dinner, I took the children to my part of the house to show them the planned renovation, including a new kitchen and a glass wall overlooking the pool. They looked anxiously at the fence dividing the backyard into two parts. They realized that one side belongs to their father. After leading them to the place where their new rooms would be on my side of the house, Tommy asked, Why do I need two bedrooms in the house, Dad? I replied, This side will be my home, and that side will be my mom's. Emma asked, Are you and Mom getting divorced, Dad? Mom is silent, despite our repeated inquiries. We recently broke up. I don't want to be a weekend dad, 
and I offered to share the house so that you can choose which side to live on every day. At this point, Linda interrupted us to inform us that dinner was served. Dinner was held in silence, and Linda looked uncomfortable. It was obvious that the children were aware of the situation, as Tommy inadvertently revealed the details. I'll move in with Dad as soon as he finishes decorating my room. Linda looked shocked. Did Dad say that you broke up? Is that not true? It's just a misunderstanding, and we're still in the process of discussing it. Emma slammed her hand on the table and demanded to know who initiated the changes. Emma and Tommy exchanged glances between Linda and me. I met Linda's gaze, who avoided my gaze and stared at her plate. When tears began to flow from Linda's eyes, the children finally understood everything. I explained to them that their mother was very tired and needed time to rest. I gently escorted Linda into the bedroom, helped her undress, and put her to bed. I kissed her on the forehead and calmed her down, as I would do with a frightened child. Turning off the light and closing the door, I focused on taking care of Linda, as I would take care of any of my children. She was like an adult child to me, imprisoned for a terrible crime, and she was facing life behind bars. I will always love my child, but he will no longer be constantly present in my daily thoughts and deeds. First I went into Tommy's room, where he was chatting with his friends. I asked if he wanted to talk about it, but he said he didn't want to. When I went into Emma's room, I found her angry and in tears. She asked, Why can't you just forgive mom? I replied, To forgive her is to betray yourself. Emma expressed her desire for our family to stay together, to which I assured her that we are still a family, despite the difficulties we face. I've decided not to share a room with your mom anymore. After hugging Emma and expressing our love for each other, I returned to my own space in the house. This order of things has become familiar to us. I still left for work early in the morning before the kids woke up, so our morning routine remained the same. Linda and I continued to take turns taking the children to various activities and sports, and if possible, we arranged family dinners in the part of the house where Linda lived. Once a week, Linda tried to bring up the subject of our relationship, but I always brushed her off, saying I didn't want to talk about it. In addition, we began to attend school events more often, at which I tried not to be near Linda during our children's classes. If she tried to approach me, I quickly bowed out and went to the toilet. When I came back, I always sat down or stood away from her. I never stayed alone for long because I always had one of the unmarried or divorced women we knew by my side. They always asked, and every time I answered the same thing, we are no longer together. The following month I went shopping, buying new clothes, household appliances, kitchen cabinets and furniture for my half. Now it was an elegant bachelor apartment with a massive TV and an updated entertainment system. While I was spending on an upper-class convertible, Linda expressed concern about our finances. Jim, can we really afford all this? My car was eight years older than yours, so it's time for a new one. You always bought cars more often than I did, so I used some of the savings for a new car. And as for everything else new, did you really think that I would live in a dilapidated house? What about the furniture? I thought I was taking care, not insisting that you sacrifice the furniture you chose to decorate your house. I am more than willing to share our furniture with you. I've never liked your taste in furniture, but I've never talked about it before because your happiness was more important to me than the furniture itself. Take the time to think about it. And don't worry about the financial aspect, we have enough money. The house has already been fully paid for, and when the children leave, my part will become too spacious for me. I plan to rent it out to earn additional income, so there won't be any financial problems. Linda gave me her winning smile, promising success, and squeezed my shoulder. She couldn't resist complimenting me on my new car, toned figure and stylish wardrobe. I thanked him kindly, acknowledging that it was not only my merit. Tommy and Emma offered to buy me a convertible so they could drive it, and Samantha helped me choose new clothes and furniture. Our tastes turned out to be surprisingly similar. At the mention of Samantha, Linda's smile disappeared, 
and she took her hand off my shoulder to leave. I wasn't going to upset Linda with Samantha's presence, but she was becoming more and more important to me. It dawned on me that now I often think about Samantha, and very little about Linda's feelings. Samantha started spending more time on my side of the house, and soon Tommy and Emma followed suit. Tommy even moved to my side as his bedroom. Emma, who usually stayed close to Linda, began spending more time with Samantha. Samantha became like a cool, older sister to Emma. Eventually, Samantha started spending all weekends and most evenings a week with me. Linda's only objection came when I invited Samantha to join our family dinner for the second time. Linda remained polite, but it was clear to everyone that she did not want this to become a regular occurrence. The next day, Linda came up to me when I was going to work. Jim, I appreciate your opinion, but I'd rather you didn't bring your girlfriend to our dinner. This is our special time for family communication with children. I nodded in agreement and assured her, I understand, but in the future, I won't attend dinner unless Samantha is there. I'll also invite you to dinner. It's not fair, Jim. This is the only opportunity to spend time together as a family. Are you being fair, Linda? To tell you the truth, Samantha has become an important part of my life, and I wish she had been more involved in it. Samantha has a great relationship with her children. I think it's unfair to leave Samantha out of our family dinners. It's not fair to her, it's not fair to me, and it's not fair to the kids. If you decide to exclude her, you will exclude me. But Jim, Linda, you've always prided yourself on being honest, even if it meant ignoring my feelings. I'm sure you thought you were being honest when you sneaked out the back door to be with Marc Lavalier. Even though we were no longer together, I was amazed by Linda's confidence that she could still control me so easily. She seemed to think she had power over me, besides taking care of our children. Linda, you gave up your sense of honor that night. If you are not satisfied with the current situation, then a fair compromise would be if I cook dinner and you join us when the dishes are ready. Samantha cooks great and enjoys it. Tears welled up in Linda's eyes, and she whispered, I'm sorry I brought this up. Samantha can come to dinner at any time. Tommy especially likes it when Kim, Christy, and Susan come to visit to sit by the newly built pool and jacuzzi. They playfully flirt with him, each trying to outdo the other to make him blush. Their friendly competition began with putting on increasingly tight swimsuits. In the end, Christy won, who sealed her victory by kissing Tommy in the pool and pressing her breasts against him. Despite the cold water, Tommy stayed in the pool for ten minutes, establishing himself as the true winner in their competition. His success aroused the admiration of the girls, as a result of which he gained self-confidence and eventually got a school girlfriend. The girls quickly lost interest in flirting as soon as they met Tommy's new girlfriend. Samantha made wonderful friends who made her happy. I made sure that Linda never came to my house because I didn't want her to complicate my relationship with Samantha. But after a few years, Samantha graduated from college, and we ended our relationship. The look on Samantha's face during Susan's wedding, which we attended together, showed that our age difference was beginning to bother her. I realized that, in fact, I was turning into her sugar daddy, and although it didn't bother me, I felt that it bothered Samantha. I want to make it clear that we had a great relationship. We spent the whole weekend together, and I had the opportunity to get to know her family better. We often went on trips together, sometimes including our children. When she started talking about moving, I asked her to marry me. She expressed gratitude for the offer, but mentioned that she wanted to preserve the family tradition. I expressed a desire to create a new family with her. Although she never spoke about it directly, I could see the inner struggle in her eyes. I was the perfect partner for her. I just wasn't the right age. Unfortunately, I began to feel unappreciated by a woman, despite being a great guy. I subtly tried to make Samantha understand that her extensive list of expectations creates a barrier that no man can overcome. Trust is crucial in any relationship. But as with Linda, I found myself being taken for granted because of my achievements. 
It was obvious that Samantha considered men like me to be easily replaceable. I said to Samantha, Linda thought the same thing, and look how it turned out for her. Samantha stated emphatically, I will never repeat her mistake. It looks like our paths have parted. In the end, I assured Samantha that I respected her decision and would be there for her if she changed her mind. Perhaps in the future, when the age difference does not seem so significant, we will meet again. I don't regret the time I spent with Samantha, and I appreciate her honesty in our conversation instead of disappearing without saying a word. Whenever I ran into Linda's friends, who were once my friends, they often tried to convince me to make peace with Linda. But after listening to their arguments, I simply replied, It sounds convincing. I couldn't help but question their values, especially after seeing their indifference to infidelity that evening. It seemed to me that they not only approved of treason, but even encouraged it. It did not come as a surprise to me that we found ourselves in a club attended by Marc Lavaliere, a famous merry man. It so happened that I was married to the most attractive woman. It's just karma. A few months later, I found out that the girls, without warning their husbands, had moved the bachelorette party to a new dance club, of which Marc Lavalier was a regular. One of Dave's colleagues mentioned to Dave that he saw Dee dancing with Marc at this club. He also noted that Marc disappeared about an hour later. At about the same time, a group of women sitting at a table left the club. Dave's friend didn't notice how Dee left with them. All the wives categorically denied their presence in the club, insisting that it was a misunderstanding. A few days later, Dave's friend shared a photo of him and his girlfriend at a club, with Marc Lavalier talking to their wives at a table in the background. After much denial, the wives eventually admitted their presence, but claimed that no one accompanied Marc. As expected, their testimony contradicted each other, and as a result, the real story surfaced. Wives didn't want to reveal who left with Mark to protect their girlfriend. But in the end, their loyalty backfired when they called Dee's name too late to save the situation. The damage has been done, trust has been undermined by a web of lies. When the husbands gathered to discuss the inconsistencies in their wives' stories, Dave's last words resonated with everyone present. They had been covering for each other for too long and it became clear that they were too easy to deceive. It wasn't the first time the ladies had spent the night out. It was obvious that Dee wasn't the only one having fun with Marc Lavalier. Every husband could see the excitement on their wives' faces when Marc Lavalier came to their table that evening. They all heard their wives praising Linda's actions and envying her abilities. Friends were delighted when Linda shared the details of her intimate encounter with Mark. At first, the husbands were happy with the new feeling in the bedroom, but after a few months, one of them jokingly complained to the other that he did not like sleeping on silk sheets. After further investigation, both discovered that they had new sets of white sheets. After talking to the other husbands, they realized that all four beds had recently been made with new white silk sheets. After Dee spent the night with Mark, the husbands began to worry that their wives were recalling their own adventures with him. As a result, all four couples divorced within a year. I found out about this when Dave, my first divorced friend, confided in me and apologized for his actions that led to the breakup of my marriage. Later, each of the husbands personally contacted me to apologize. All of them expressed regret and admitted that if they had stood up for me then, it could have served as a stronger signal for their own wives and, perhaps, would have saved their marriages. Marc Lavalier's habit of stalking married women eventually angered the wrong man. The attacker, who has not yet been identified, struck when Marc was leaving the club with his latest winner. Wearing a ski mask, he hit Marc with a stun gun and then inflicted a painful blow to the groin area. While Mark was screaming in agony and holding on to his injured groin, the attacker, despite the video cameras, continued to stab Mark. No one has ever been prosecuted for this crime. Many husbands had motives and opportunities to commit it. Mark became disabled and lost the ability to walk, 
and Linda suffered a different fate. The last conversation about our relationship took place the day Emma left home for college. By that time we had already divorced, I rented out my part of the house and moved into a house by the sea. When Emma was leaving, Linda came up to me in the driveway and asked if we could talk. Jim, I can't stop loving you. I made a huge mistake that I regret every day. I can't move on and I don't even think about being with anyone else. I know you haven't had a serious relationship since Samantha, and I'd like to know if you'd like to move in with me to see if we can be together again. Linda took the necklace off her neck and handed it to me. At the end of the chain hung my wedding ring, a symbol of the love I once shared with her. Linda, you still don't understand the situation. That night you thought you were testing my love for you, but in fact it was a test of your love for me. I'm really worried about you. But you don't love me. You like the life we once had, the perfect marriage, the perfect husband and the perfect children. You liked that I respected you as an equal partner, not as property or a trophy wife. You liked that our passion, although not as frequent, remained as ardent as at the very beginning. You appreciated that I always put your feelings first. You found solace in the financial stability I provided by allowing you to follow your desires. But above all, you didn't appreciate my unwavering trust in you. Now you love me even more because you realize that no one else can give you the same happiness. No one can love you as much as I once did. Linda remained motionless. Her hand paled and tightened her grip on the necklace. You couldn't appreciate what we had, and now it's lost. I can't stay with you anymore. I will not allow myself to be in a situation where you can hurt me again. I always believed that you and I were against the whole world. But you destroyed that idea when you went to Marc Lavalier. Tears welled up in Linda's eyes. I can't tell you how much I regret choosing him over our relationship. It was never about the brand, Linda. You may have been happy when he chose you, but I didn't feel the same way. Even when I was at rock bottom and your friends were trying to convince me that I was stupid because I felt insulted, I suddenly realized that it was I who made us a great couple, not you. You left me because my love was strong, not yours. My love would never do what you did. It was my love that was the melody of our dance, making us special. Sitting at the table, angry and thinking about it, I noticed Samantha at the other end of the room who looked sad. When she caught my eye, she smiled, and it warmed my heart. At that moment, I remembered my value as a man and the possibility of happiness with another person. The thought that I could share my love and devotion with someone new filled me with hope for the future of us. That's when you opened my eyes and set me free. With a grin on my face, I jumped into my convertible and drove away, eager to get home. Last week, Samantha left her job in another city and moved in with me, marking the beginning of a new chapter in our lives. Since then, she has shown me that she greatly appreciates my presence in her life. Trust is a really wonderful thing. As for Linda, she has never started a new relationship. As the children tell her, she is delirious with memories of our once happy family. Sometimes she writes me long messages and apologetically asks me to come back to her, but usually I don't finish reading these letters, so I don't see the point in this. I am happy with Samantha, who is carrying my child, and I am just incredibly happy about it. And Linda will regret her terrible act, because once she was happy with me, I and our family made her happy, and now she will grow old in highness. I found myself in a strange state. It may seem contradictory, but I was somehow aware of my own death. I was sitting at Café Brasileira in Lisbon, a historic café with a charming atmosphere reminiscent of the 18th century. The café, located on Rocio Street in the Chiado district, has wooden booths, mirrored walls, and a long bar made of oak panels. Strangely, I liked looking at the local girls, especially Maria Joao, who was walking towards me with a curious look. As she approached, I hesitated, wondering if it was appropriate for a man to feel excitement while admiring her beautiful figure. 
Deciding to keep my thoughts to myself, I just nodded when she asked if I wanted to drink Al Rabiki and if I would have dinner with her that evening. I answered in the affirmative and enthusiastically. Perhaps I should clarify some details. Before my death, I was known as Dave Lawrence, Marsha's devoted husband living in Colorado. Now I am known as William Billy Sanderson, an American expat from Colorado who lives in a cozy apartment in Lisbon's Barrio Alto neighborhood on Rua do Norte Street. I first met Maria about six months ago in one of the local cafes. She was 28 years old at the time, and she sometimes helped her aunt, who owned the place. Maria stood out from other Portuguese women with her height, just over 5 feet 10 inches. She couldn't be called slim, perhaps it would be more correct to call her thin. Her weight was about 120 pounds, and her curves were soft, graceful rather than bold. Her legs seemed endless. If you've seen someone like Daniela Hantachova with a height of 5 feet 11 inches and a weight of 123 pounds, you'll understand what I'm trying to convey. In my estimation, she had breasts slightly larger than average, radiating confidence. Her long legs led to a stunningly beautiful bottom. She had dirty blonde hair and symmetrical blonde features with an upturned button nose. Maria was a striking beauty with a fair complexion and captivating powder blue eyes decorated with a scattering of freckles. When I got to know her better, I discovered that freckles adorn other areas of her skin. If you were wandering the streets of Lisbon and saw her approaching, she would undoubtedly attract your attention. Maria was originally from the island of Tercera in the Azores, where her father, an American technical sergeant, served in the meteorological service of the 65th Air Wing at Lodges Field Airfield. Her mother, a local girl, worked in the library of the base, and it was there that her parents' paths crossed. After that, the parents tied the knot, and soon, Maria appeared. After moving around the world related to her father's military service, the family's life took a tragic turn when he died in a car accident while serving at Pope Air Force Base. Maria, who was studying marketing and literature at Duke University at the time, had to interrupt her studies while her mother moved to Lisbon to work in her sister's cafe. Eventually, Maria graduated from university and moved to live with her mother in Lisbon, dividing her time between working in a cafe and helping a friend create a small agency for authors of romantic novels called Pulp Fiction. Her work at the agency was aimed at translating these novels into and from different languages. A year later, she found love and tied the knot with Rate Khalifa, a football player for Sporting Lisbon. When the couple's daughter Katrina was born, Manchester City acquired his contract. Maria was preparing to join him with the child, but he unexpectedly interrupted their plans after meeting with the dancer, telling Maria not to come. Maria was very upset by this situation, but a year later she realized that her ex was just a carefree athlete who would never grow up. The agency exceeded all expectations by signing contracts with several writers from the USA, Spain and Portugal, as well as with several from France and Ireland. It reminded me of my own mortality, and I felt that I admired Maria. She came over to chat with me several times that evening, and I offered to walk her home when she was about to leave. Despite the fact that we had known each other for only six months, our bond was very strong. It was only after a casual conversation over a cup of coffee that I needed writers in English that I began to consider her as a potential future. She needed translators, and she was also looking for new writers. Being fluent in Spanish, I started translating romantic stories from the USA and England into Spanish. I mentioned to her that I have a passion for writing and thought it would be nice. I shared with her the stories and the novel I was working on. That's how it all started. I started with translations and gradually introduced several of my own romantic works. Having immersed myself in a new business, I began to spend more time with Maria Joao and Katrina. As we walked to her apartment, she intertwined her hand with mine, and we talked while admiring the desserts in the bakery windows. I was enjoying life until we went to her mom's to pick up Katrina, who was four years old. As we were climbing the stairs, the door suddenly burst open and Katrina ran out to meet me, shouting my name. 
Although Maria and I did not have a close relationship, I felt that we were getting closer. She was lonely, but she took great care of her daughter. As soon as I saw Katrina, I realized that I had fallen in love. In my previous life, I was more restrained. My wife and I have never had children, but with Katrina it was different. She captured my heart in a way I've never experienced before. One of the reasons why the relationship with Maria developed was that her daughter constantly got between us. As I stumbled down the stairs, I reached out and playfully grabbed Katrina, tickling her, she laughed. Then she ran up the stairs to her grandmother, Fee, and we exchanged a few words before heading to Maria's apartment. While I'm cooking dinner, could you give Katrina an English lesson? Today we will eat bakalhawa bra paired with the excellent Vigno Verde wine. I've been studying with Katrina for about two months now, reading her children's books in English. She loves these stories, and I often told her bedtime stories after mom put her to bed. Despite all her attempts to stay awake, she always fell asleep after a few minutes. I suspect that this was Maria's cunning way of pushing Katrina to learn English. While we enjoy the cod and wine, let's continue to support Katrina's language development. Maria looked at me seriously and said, We need to talk when Katrina falls asleep. I panicked, wondering what I had done wrong this time. Despite the fact that I was eagerly finishing my lunch, I had no idea what it was going to be about. While we sipped coffee and enjoyed a delicious vintage port, Katrina entertained herself with toys. Maria was preparing her daughter for bed and tidying up the kitchen, and I was reading Katrina a bedtime story. I relaxed on the couch with another small port, looking forward to Maria's return. Finally, she entered the room and asked, May I join you? She whispered softly, and I opened my arms in response so that she could hug me and settle on my lap. Confused by her sudden emotional outburst, I remained motionless, wrapping my arms around her. As her shoulders trembled, I gently lifted her chin to meet her tear-stained eyes. I asked, and she burst into tears. I held her close and comforted her, waiting for her sobs to subside. Eventually, she raised her head, wiped her eyes with her sleeve and looked at me silently, and then buried her face in my shoulder again. She whispered softly, Billy, I can see that you have sincere feelings for me, and your kindness to Katrina means a lot to me. Please don't say anything yet. I feel so lonely, she admitted quietly. I want you. I long to be with you. None of us seem to talk about it, but I believe that God intended us to be together. You are the answer to my prayers both for yourself and for Katrina. Maria paused, then continued. No, wait, let me finish. I'm grateful for your presence in my life, but I haven't been completely honest. And with that, she started crying again. After a moment of silence, she spoke again. I've already told you about Paolo, my ex-husband. Billy, I'm a Catholic, you know that. I can't get a divorce and I can't marry you. With that, she collapsed to the floor, her body shaking with sobs. I was stunned, not knowing what to say or do. Get married? Why did she even bring it up? I felt like a fool. After a while, Maria's crying subsided and she fell asleep. I watched her for a while, feeling lost. In the end, I picked her up and carried her into the bedroom, carefully laying her on the bed. I gently wiped her face with a damp cloth while she tossed and turned in her sleep, but did not wake up. Not knowing what to do next, I decided to put her to bed. Taking a robe from the dresser, I carefully undressed her and dressed her neatly. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I put her to bed, not wanting to leave her alone in this state, and lay down on the sheet next to her. It took me a while to fall asleep, and lying in bed, I couldn't help but retell the events that had happened. Up to this point, I had never thought about the difficulties of marriage. If her problem seemed simple, just a matter of religion, then mine was much more complicated. When my wife was behind bars, most likely for the rest of her life, the idea of divorce came to my mind. But then I wouldn't be dead to her anymore. How could I continue to live a lie 
pretending to be faithful to the woman I loved so much that I married her, and at the same time be a bigamist? Life, of course, becomes confusing when you are no longer alive. The first glimmer of dawn broke through the darkness, and when I opened my eyes, I saw Maria sitting up in bed and looking at me. Blushing deeply, she asked, Billy, how did I end up in bed in a bathrobe without taking off my dress? I looked at her, admiring her delicate beauty in the soft morning light. Maria, you fell asleep on the floor. I took you to bed and covered you up. I was going to go to my apartment, but I couldn't leave you like this. I put a robe on you and stayed by your side. I didn't know what else to do, I explained. I decided not to mention the brief moment when I undressed her before putting the dress back on. Her cheeks flushed even more as she listened to my words. I watched as the freckles seemed to multiply under the thin gauze of her dress. Feeling awkward, she would lie down next to me and bury her face in my shoulder. It was becoming a common occurrence, but I didn't mind at all. After a few minutes, I wrapped my arms around her and hugged her to me. Maria, it's my turn to speak now. Just be quiet for a bit and let me speak, I said softly. I turned her to face me and kissed her gently on the lips. Stunned by my own realization, I pulled away and at the same moment realized that I really loved her. I loved her with every fiber of my being. Maria was lying in front of me, her curious smile inviting me in. I bent down to kiss that charming smile, her motionless figure lying with her eyes closed. She whispered, Oh, Billy, oh, Billy, I was so lonely. Make love to me, even now. That's what we did. After that, I noticed how tears flowed from her closed eyes. But when she looked up at me, I saw that they were tears of joy. Billy, I don't care what happens. I love you. I just want to be with you. I love you. I can't live without you. Katrina is counting on you, too. Please show me your love now, she begged. Our love was strong, but Katrina's presence made us pause and have a serious conversation. Surprisingly, a smile appeared on her face. We discussed our future, and soon I moved in with her. I eventually became a Portuguese citizen and officially adopted Katrina. I joined her agency, leaving my job as a translator to focus on writing romantic novels, which quickly became a success. I took the name of a famous woman as a pseudonym. A few years later we bought a beautiful apartment in Casquiz, just a few blocks from the ocean. Although we no longer talked about marriage, we often discussed our love for each other. I've never been so happy. The darkness and despair that I once felt were gone. I was living for real. But as they say, life is unpredictable. You're probably wondering how I met my end. Now it's like a distant memory. Some details have been erased from memory and the anger has subsided. I don't get hung up on Marcia anymore. Whether she's in jail or not doesn't matter to me. I don't care about that. Whether it's free or locked, it doesn't make any difference to me. I've never checked. I just want her to stay away from me. Most of all, I remember the anger I felt when I came across these letters. I wasn't spying. I wasn't worried about anything. At that time, my marriage was happy. I accidentally downloaded a virus to my computer, which caused me to reinstall several applications. The email system caused the most problems. Before deleting it, I made sure to copy the email archive file to a zip disk. After reinstalling the mail client, I found that all my passwords had been erased. Only the default password remained. I made a mental note to inform Marsha of the situation. After installing the program and restarting the mail archive, I checked again whether everything was working correctly. After making sure that everything else was working fine, I decided that this would solve the problem. It turned out that my email was working fine, and it was good. After a little thought, I decided to check Marsha's email as well. I knew she might get upset if the computer didn't work. I remembered that you need to change your password before using the program for the first time. I planned to reinstall the program after the verification was completed and did not want to deal with Marsha's complaints. I entered the password and logged into her email, but was shocked by what I found. The headlines caught my attention. The conversation between the obnoxious Andrew and Marsha was tense. The images were provocative, 
But most of all I was burning with rage. She absorbed and overwhelmed me. I couldn't even catch my breath. I rushed into the bathroom, splashed cold water on my face trying to calm down. Nausea seized me, and I hunched over the toilet, feeling my insides spilling out. In search of solace, I retired to my office and poured myself a small glass of Oban, quickly emptying it. And then another one. And another one. When I finally came to my senses, I stopped drinking and focused on my breathing and thoughts. The anger that consumed me formed into a frozen ball in my chest, feeling like a destructive force eating away at me from the inside. Only years later, when a beautiful four-year-old girl appeared in my life, this fatal feeling began to disappear. Despite the initial hatred for her and for him, I channeled these emotions to support myself. I was purposeful, smart, and had a vivid imagination. My father always stressed that in difficult times, it is important not to succumb to weaknesses, but to rely on your strengths. Although I never wondered why he felt the need to constantly give this advice, I always took it to heart. Writing has always been my strong suit, especially in the form of novels. Whether it's a crime, a detective story, or a murder mystery, I have achieved success and recognition in my works. I carefully conduct research and consult with law enforcement agencies to ensure accuracy in my work. I've talked to prisoners, judges, journalists, and victims. I had a wide network of acquaintances. A few years ago I met an inmate for the first time at the Colorado Territorial Prison in Cannon City. I helped him with things like cigarettes and helping his son in a difficult situation in exchange for his time and advice on a writer's dilemma. After his release a few years later, I helped him find a job and continued to help him with various tasks. Sometimes I paid him for research work. He turned out to be a reliable and trustworthy person who keeps his promises. Glenn has increased the credibility of my stories and increased my finances. When I found myself in desperate need, I turned to him for help. I came to him, taking a cold beer with me, and confessed that I needed a man who would deal with me, or rather, with my cheating wife and her lover. I showed him incriminating photos and told him the whole dastardly story, asking him for help. We approached the situation as if it was a fresh idea for a novel, and someday I will be able to write it, of course, under a different pseudonym. When I was making up the storyboard, carefully working through every detail, it might have seemed to an outsider that we were plotting to rob Fort Knox. Our plan was to come to fruition during Marsh's upcoming workshop, when I would go to the stunningly picturesque place Evergreen in the foothills of Denver. Having become the perfect husband, I showered Marsha with love, although she periodically wondered about my sudden changeability. Despite her bewilderment, I continued to focus on writing, and our intimacy became a little more intense. Instead of complaining, she began to enjoy it more. Every day, her happiness grew, and I felt that I was fading away. For me, she has become nothing more than an object, a piece of meat that can be used. But I soon realized that she had been using me all this time. I shared with her a fictitious computer problem, saying that I had reinstalled the program with an empty password. I did not forget to inform her that she would need to enter her password before logging into the mail, knowing full well that she was a lying woman. Since she changed her password regularly, I started to get wise. I just copied the archived file of her mail to my laptop and opened it. I've been monitoring her emails daily. One day Andrew texted her asking if she had noticed anything strange. She replied, No, if anything, he has become even more affectionate. God, what a fool he is, Andrew replied. Yes, but he's my fool. I care about him, but I also like being around you. He is so engrossed in his writing that only someone who wrote it himself can notice anything. One of my favorite sayings is, the one who laughs last laughs. Three months later she was preparing for her next five-day seminar in San Antonio. She had no idea that eternal hell was waiting for her. Yes, I know. You probably think I'm a vindictive person. And you're right. Will I cry? Do you think I'm going to cry? No, I won't cry. I have many reasons to cry, but it will break your heart into a thousand pieces. I didn't want to shed tears, 
I didn't want to cry for anything. It's time to meet your end. Glenn and I thought through every detail carefully, dividing it into three main components that had to match flawlessly. The first step was figuring out how to end your life. The second step was my rebirth. And the last step was to ensure that all sinners were sent straight to hell. Every piece of the puzzle was in its place. It's time to put our plan into action. The first obstacle we faced was money. I needed to disappear without a trace, leaving behind everything except the clothes I was wearing. Fortunately, I had a commission check stashed away that would help finance my escape. After Marsha left, I went to the bank to deposit a check containing a little over $20,000. I have set aside about $2,500 for everyday expenses. This will be a good starting point. Most of the funds can be easily taken with you, but it still wasn't enough. Marsha had some heirloom jewelry that she inherited from her grandmother. Although I did not know their current value, a few years ago they were estimated for insurance at a quarter of a million dollars. Keeping them in the house was too risky because of their high cost. The jewelry was too outdated for Marsha to wear, so we kept it in a safe deposit box. They were kept in a locked drawer inside the safe, and the keys to it were in our home safe. While Marsha was leaving on her infamous trip, I took the jewelry from the bank and left in its place a large envelope filled with tax documents for the past year. I entrusted the sale of the jewelry to Glenn, and he managed to get a little less than $100,000 for them. I paid him $10,000 for his help, and hoped that the remaining amount would cover my expenses after my death, as well as give me enough money to live for a year or more. I have set aside a valuable emerald brooch worth about $5,000 for future use. A few days after Marcia returned from San Antonio, I caught her just as she was getting ready for work. Baby, could you do me a favor? I asked. I have an envelope with tax documents and a bank key that I need. Could you come to my place during lunch and pick it up? Marcia agreed and asked me to take the key for her. I took it out of the safe while you were taking a shower. Thank you very much. I'll pay you back with a back massage later. I can't wait, she replied with a laugh. Without the key to the box, she could not access the jewelry, and there was no need for that. The last time the box was opened for evaluation. Now she was the last person to use the safe. The tax documents were left in the file cabinet at home. Anyone could look at them, if she remembered picking them up at all. After that, I needed official documents. I knew it would be expensive. Glenn introduced me to his friend. This man has worked in the CIA's documentation department for more than three decades. His job was to create forged documents that agents could use to gain access to other countries. Only a few items were needed for my needs. After discussing this with Glenn, we decided to get a well-preserved passport, a driver's license, a car insurance card with valid coverage, and a backup plan in case of requests, an international driver's license, a visa, Amex cards, and a bank letter of credit. In fact, I needed all the necessary documents for my mission. I had a choice, either pay $10,000 and wait six months, or pay $20,000 and get the job done in just six weeks. I couldn't wait because I had urgent business. With letters from my new agent about a novel under a new name and a manuscript almost ready for editing, I couldn't afford to delay any longer. And so we began the terrible process of my disappearance, starting with the need for blood. Glenn had a friend who worked in the infirmary of the state prison. They met in the back room of a bar in Trinidad, south of Denver, near the New Mexico border. A friend took about a dozen vials of my blood and kept them in the refrigerator with ice. Then I put some of the blood in the trunk of her car and I casually cleaned up after myself. I scattered a few drops of blood in the corner of the trunk along with the matting. I added a couple of hairs from my head to the wet blood. I also smeared some blood on the carpet in the laundry room leading to the garage. I hurried with the cleaning. I added a few drops of blood under the rear bumper of the car. Glenn borrowed a shovel from Andrew's shed and left it in my shed. I smeared the shovel with blood and washed it a little better, but not perfectly. That night, 
Glenn broke the lock on Andrew's apartment, and we went inside. I took some hairs from Andrew's brush to mix with my household ones and put the wand under the pillow in our bedroom. I carefully pulled an empty beer can out of his trash can to add it to our kitchen trash. I was lucky enough to come across a used contraceptive in the trash in his bathroom. I discreetly threw it behind the toilet and the bathtub, knowing that it would take a thorough cleaning to find it. Taking the emerald brooch, I carefully wrapped it in one of his handkerchiefs and hid it in the bottom drawer of the closet, hiding it under sweaters. Glenn got hold of a mobile phone in the name of Andrew, which I used to contact the hotel. I knew he wouldn't drive his car because Marsha's company always provided a limo to the airport. I took the key to his locker at Cherry Chase Country Club and later returned it to its place. During lunch at the club, I went into the locker room where I left his mobile phone, and no one noticed it. Glenn and I tried to be inconspicuous during our visit. The day before Marsha left, I asked Glenn to pick up her car and drive her to Denver and back. New radar detectors have been installed on the I-70 highway descending from the foothills. Radars detected anyone speeding up the hill by more than 10 miles and photographed their license plate. The radars were still being tested, and their legality was questionable, but we didn't care. Our only goal was to get her car to this place early in the morning. In the days leading up to Marsha's departure, I tried to cover my tracks. For example, I checked my email, even though I should have been dead. I left my wallet, which contained everything, on a silver tray in the drawer where I always kept it. It contained a little over $600, the usual amount. I decided to eat out so as not to make a mess at home, but at the same time I deliberately avoided fast food. I completely gave up coffee, tea, beer, and everything else that was not in my house. I even stopped drinking strong alcohol so as not to get distracted and make mistakes. I lived at Glen's and walked back and forth without even using the toilet in my house. I avoided my usual hangouts, including my favorite bars and restaurants. I tried to avoid places where I might meet a familiar face. I only came to the house late at night and parked Glen's car far from the site. I received a new prescription for blood pressure and cholesterol medications from the same person who took a blood sample from me. I extended the validity of the recipes over the internet to my new name and sent them to Glenn's address. I avoided visiting nearby shops in order to remain as inconspicuous as possible. I was saying goodbye to a significant amount of money, a lifestyle that I cherished, and several friends that I will miss very much. Fortunately, my family was quite small. My sister lived in Boston, and we only saw each other once every two years. Despite the fact that she missed me, she had a lot to do with her husband, children, and work. I had about $600,000 in cash and almost in cash scattered across various accounts and about half a million in an IRA account. The net worth of my house in Evergreen was about $700,000. In addition, I was leaving my successful career as a crime writer, which brought me a lot of money. I've had four novels that have already been contracted, and two of them have received advances. One of the novels was in the process of being edited and was due to be published in a few months. I left my silver BMW M6 coupe in the garage for them. It seemed like I was going to miss my car more than Marsha. If I had children, I would leave everything to them. But if I had children, everything would be different. I could have just kicked Marsha out. But then I wouldn't have had the opportunity to take revenge. I've been planning this for a long time especially on the nights after our intimacy. After I discovered these letters, I no longer had an intimate relationship with her. Instead, I craved revenge and cherished the thought of it. Perhaps my actions were vindictive, but they seemed justified. As night fell, it was time to act. I said goodbye to Glenn in Albuquerque and took a bus to El Paso. My fake documents looked battered and my luggage looked even more battered. In El Paso, I packed suitcases with a brand new wardrobe, including clothes of different brands and styles, as well as shoes, socks, and underwear. Then I took a taxi to Juarez, and from there I took a bus to Mexico City. From there I flew to Buenos Aires and spent a week in a relaxed state, enjoying delicious food and wine. I also got a new hairstyle and updated the eyeglass frames to look more modern. 
Continuing my journey, I flew to Madrid on another airline and took the train to Lisbon. Finally, in Lisbon, I found a cozy apartment in which I could settle down. By joining a local sports club and starting regular physical exercise, I made a conscious effort to improve my eating habits. I completely eliminated fast food from my diet and lost 20 pounds in the first four months. As a result, my blood pressure and cholesterol levels decreased, which allowed me to stop taking medications. Along with the weight loss, I gradually updated my wardrobe to reflect a more European style. Despite my previous disdain for romantic novels, I realized that I needed to start making money, and used my fluency in Spanish to look for opportunities. In search of inspiration, I began to immerse myself in tabloid fiction in English and Spanish. While reading, I wrote down ideas for plots, and wrote several short stories. I revised the manuscript I was working on, incorporating elements from what I had read into it, and started looking for a publisher. Maria Joao had a deep influence on me, and I really liked Katrina. Surprisingly, I'm learning Portuguese faster than I expected. Life is kind to me. And as for my dear wife Marcia, will I ever shed tears for her? I doubt it very much. She belongs in prison and I'm sure she deserves it. My childhood fascination and admiration for Zorro has never waned. Despite the fact that I was born a thin and not athletically built weirdo, I idolized his fearless bravado and damask skills, striving to imitate him. To tell the truth, I couldn't even match Don Diego's coolness. I was 23 years old when I found myself at the end of a long line waiting for an opportunity to attend Comic-Con, the annual comic book convention in San Diego. I was traveling from Los Angeles by train, surrounded by a crowd of over a hundred people dressed in costumes from all kinds of movies and TV shows. Standing in line at the convention center, I found myself behind a couple in Superman and Supergirl costumes, as well as in front of a girl named Enid, who was dressed in a Princess Leia costume that accentuated her amazing figure. Her costume was immaculate, the only difference with the princess, Enid was a blonde, much more attractive, even than the beautiful Carrie Fisher. On the other hand, I was dressed like Zorro, a leather jacket, a Zorro-style hat, a mask, and a raincoat. Princess Leia, who has a sharp mind, asked me, How do I measure the length of the queue? Two parsecs, I replied, making her laugh. In Star Wars, Han Solo mistakenly calls a parsec a unit of speed, when in fact he measures distance. But Princess Leia understood the difference perfectly well. While we were standing in line for two hours, Enid and I had the opportunity to learn a lot about each other. It was customary to take pictures of each other at Comic-Con, so we were happy to pose for a lot of pictures. We spent the whole day at the convention together, and when it was time to return to Los Angeles, we boarded the train along with hundreds of other visitors, many of whom were dressed in various costumes. Sitting between the Jedi Knights and the Stormtroopers, I jokingly tried to make a truce between the two groups. We were both tired, and Enid fell asleep with her head on my shoulder. Enid worked at the University of California Research Library, and I was a nerd getting an MBA in computer science from the same university. This moment became the most intimate in my life, and I found that I didn't want the train ride to end. I could not imagine that I would have a future with such a beautiful and amazing girl like Enid. She was fast asleep until the train stopped at Union Station. When she woke up, she said that she felt safe and protected in the arms of such a fearless and strong man as Zorro, and then kissed me on the cheek, leaving me in bliss. She offered to meet for lunch at the University of California cafeteria on Tuesday, as soon as we recovered from the weekend, and I was so happy that I could only nod in response. After leaving the station, we walked hand in hand to our cars in the parking lot. Our relationship blossomed, led to marriage, and eventually, to the appearance of children. Ten years later, during one of our moves to a new home, the memories of that special moment remained in my heart. Losing the Zorro costume was a disappointment to me, although my wife didn't seem to mind. She thought it was a signal that I had matured, 
but I didn't agree with her. Despite the responsibilities of a father, husband, and full-time employee, I still liked to change into a Zorro from time to time. I once tried to have an intimate relationship with my wife in a suit, but her laughter killed the moment. Someone may consider me immature and say that I have not matured, but I take it as a compliment. Who in their right mind wants to grow old? Once you get to the age where you can drive and drink legally, there aren't many benefits with age, except for things like social security and health insurance. I believe it was my constant immaturity that initially attracted my wife to me, and certainly not my wealth or lack thereof. Despite earning a decent income as a regional geek sales manager at Best Buy, I still wasn't making a fortune, but I could always make my wife laugh until recently. She worked as a representative of a pharmaceutical company and often went on business trips, leaving me to reflect on the realities of adulthood. She claimed it was all business, or at least, that's what she told me. She talked to rich doctors every day and I felt inferior. I felt the growing distance between us, and when I dared to broach the subject, she silenced me with a kiss, at least for a while. In my younger years I was considered attractive, but now, at the age of about 40, my average appearance and thinning gray hair made me feel invisible. Meanwhile, my wife continued to blossom every year, becoming even more beautiful in her early 40s. She was a stunning beauty, who not only did not leave me indifferent, but also attracted the attention of her best friend's husband, Mr. Charles Sands. Charlie was 10 years younger than me, a fit and muscular man with a shock of hair. During the Labor Day picnic, where we gathered as a family, it became obvious that there was a strong bond between them that they did not try to hide. Even Charlie's wife, Estelle, jokingly said that they needed to be looked after, but it was clear that she was not joking at all. Charlie was my friend's gym partner, and it was obvious that his muscles were bigger than mine, as well as bigger than my brain. He was constantly trying to surpass me in everything. Just a week after I bought a 45-inch TV, he bought a 54 inches one, and when I bought a Toyota Corolla, he switched to a Toyota Camry. My wife even said that I should go to the gym like Charlie, who can do push-ups 50 times. But unlike Charlie, I can count to 10 without using my fingers. I felt bad when I saw that you and Charlie had become too friendly at the picnic, so I think we should give up communication with him and his family for a while. My wife comforted me with a kiss, saying that I had nothing to worry about. Although I trusted her, I remembered President Reagan's advice. Trust, but verify. But when she added that she wouldn't let me dictate the rules to her or control her, I realized that we were heading for trouble. A week later on Tuesday morning, my new home call camera sent a signal to my phone at work at 11 a.m. that someone was at my front door. It turned out to be Charlie. After my wife let him in, they disappeared inside. I quickly informed my colleagues that I was leaving for my lunch break and hurried home. Not knowing how to handle the situation and not run into trouble, especially considering Charlie's strength, I decided to proceed more cautiously. I punctured all four tires of Charlie's car before driving back to work, hoping that he would take the hint and stop pestering my wife. Unfortunately, it seems that I overestimated his mental abilities. Despite my suspicions, my wife showed no signs of inappropriate behavior. Although our intimacy had weakened in recent months, there were no obvious signs of infidelity. I carefully checked her phone, a skill honed by my profession, but found nothing suspicious. As a last resort, I even checked her closet for evidence. I discovered a new seductive red lingerie that she never wore intending to please me. I tried to take her away for a romantic weekend in Santa Barbara to rekindle our passion, but she insisted she had too much work to do. I begged her, explaining that our marriage was on the verge of collapse, but she remained firm in her decision. I was crushed. I thought what would my idol Zorro do in such a situation? On the eve of Halloween I bought a Zorro costume, keeping it a secret from my wife and children. When I was alone at home I would go out into the spacious backyard, put on a suit and play with my whip. Using a marker, I drew two parallel lines on the telephone pole about six inches apart. 
Standing about 10 feet away, I practiced until I could wrap the whip around the post between the two lines 10 times out of 10. It's like riding a bike. You'll never forget how it's done. While some angry men use a punching bag to relieve tension, I found solace in using the whip to blow off steam when life presented me with hardships or my wife cheated on me. I was at a loss, not knowing what to do. Trying to embody the spirit of Zoro, I thought about what actions he would take. It was clear that he would not passively accept the situation. He was known for his active stance, and I knew I had to follow his example. As my anger grew, so did my determination. When Charlie showed up again at 11 a.m. the following Tuesday, I took matters into my own hands. Despite the pouring rain, I decided to superglue the door locks and windshield wipers of his old pickup truck. I was sure that this would finally convey the idea to him. But, as expected, Charlie remained impassive. That evening my wife had a headache and was not in the mood. I was also in no mood to get intimate with a woman who had recently been with a man who was most likely with several other women. Their bodies were most likely a breeding ground for germs and diseases, and I didn't want to take part in it. I knew I should have discussed this situation with her, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I was afraid that if I brought up this topic I would burst into tears, and I didn't want to do it in front of her. I've shed enough tears in private as it is. In the evening, my wife informed me that on Saturday she would go with her friends to a bachelorette party in honor of Halloween. The sinking feeling in my stomach confirmed what I had already suspected. My marriage was coming to an end. Despite this, I couldn't get rid of the desire for revenge. I may be considered a bore, but the thought of taking revenge on my wife consumed me. I have never resorted to cruelty, especially towards someone I once loved. But Charlie's revenge, which ruined my marriage, began to loom in my mind. The rage that was growing inside me threatened to spill out with a destructive force unlike anything I had experienced before. Drawing inspiration from the image of Zorro, I devised a plan that would not only satisfy my need for revenge, but also allow me to regain a sense of power that I could not control. For the money, I bought a black electric bike capable of reaching speeds of up to 25 miles per hour, which is about the same as driving a car in our city. The bike cost much less than hiring a private investigator. On the night of the Halloween bachelorette party, my wife changed into a little red riding hood and didn't want me to know about her plans. Knowing about my technological skills, she left her phone and car at home and drove with a friend, perhaps suspecting that I had installed a GPS tracker in her car. And she was right. She was very smart. I decided to wear two shirts and two pairs of trousers, both black, to match my Zorro costume. My whip, raincoat, mask, and Zorro hat were safely stored in my saddlebag while I rode behind my wife's friend's car on my new electric bike, named Tornado after Zorro's horse. I would prefer the name Diablo, but you can't argue with the fox Zorro. The traffic was so heavy that I had to slow down to avoid missing her friend's car. As the moment of truth approached, my anger and pain turned to glee. I watched them walk into a dodgy bar in Santa Monica known for its scams. I parked the bike and put on a mask and a Zorro costume, feeling a rush of adrenaline. Soon, Charlie appeared in the costume of a big scary wolf, unknowingly walking towards his fate. Excitement gripped me. I braced myself, untangling the whip and preparing for action. I swung the whip with all my might, and it flew through the air with a loud crack, wrapping around Charlie's neck. Using all my strength, I yanked him back, forcing him to fall to the ground and grab his throat in pain. Maybe it wasn't a fair fight, but I've always believed that tactics are wrong in a fair fight, especially if you're up against a weightlifter who can easily beat you. I walked up to Charlie, let go of the whip from his neck while he was trying to catch his breath, and without hesitation, I delivered a powerful blow to the solar plexus, and then a strong kick to the ribs, possibly even breaking several of them. He caught his breath with difficulty, and I struck him between the legs. My intentions were clear. He would not approach my wife in the near future. While he was lying on the ground in agony, 
I took out a black indelible marker from my pocket and drew a large letter Z on his forehead with my left hand. It will not be easy to remove it. He will have to scrub it for at least a week. It may have been immature and stupid, but at that moment it was the highlight of my daily life. I have finally avenged my betrayal by proving that I am not just a passive Mr. Nice Guy, but an audacious renegade. Like the TV character Zorro portrayed by Guy Williams, I silently confronted the man who had caused me months of pain. In a matter of minutes, I was able to free myself from the burden he had placed on me. Having regained my pride and self-respect, I was surprised to find that I had regained my sense of humor. I laughed to myself as I quickly returned to my electric bike and drove off into the moonlit night, humming a song from a classic 50s TV show. As Zorro, I felt strong because I had done my job and left the situation behind. My heart ached when, on the way home, I threw a magic marker, a whip, a mask, a hat, black trousers, a black shirt and a raincoat into various garbage containers. It was undesirable to leave evidence in the house. I parked my electric bike a few blocks from home, took my fingerprints and left it unlocked, knowing that it would soon be stolen. I replaced the doorbell with a regular one to erase any connection with the novel. When my wife came back and accused me, I pretended to be a fool. She screamed, I know it was you. She hurried upstairs to our bedroom, hastily packed her suitcase, cursing viciously at me, and then rushed out. The next morning, four police officers appeared on my doorstep with a search warrant. A petite and charming woman with blonde hair styled in a pixie haircut reminiscent of the 50s, and looking 10 years younger than me, read aloud the items they were allowed to look for. A Damascus whip, a black raincoat, a black mask, a black hat, trousers, a shirt, and a black electric bike. She couldn't help but laugh as she read the list. I laughed with her and asked if she was leading me by the nose, asking if they were really police officers and if one of them was really Sergeant Garcia. They were too young to know Garcia, and unlike me, they didn't watch classic TV shows on cable. I jokingly suggested that we might be participating in a hidden camera show and looked around for signs of a film crew. After a short search they excused themselves and left. The female officer, Lara, handed me her business card and continued to laugh. She tried to start a conversation about my activities the previous night. When I was asked if I knew about my wife's infidelity, I pretended to be surprised. I was silent, not wanting to fall into her trap. Criminals often expose themselves in their own words, like Martha Stewart. A few days later, I received the divorce papers and a restraining order, according to which I had to be 500 feet away from my wife and her lover Charlie. Since she earned more than me, I didn't have to pay alimony. Due to her frequent business trips, I received primary custody of our teenage children and paid a small amount of alimony. Despite feeling guilty for not telling Charlie's wife about the affair between my wife and her husband, in the end it didn't matter. Charlie and my wife eventually left together and loved each other passionately for almost six months before their relationship broke up. The reasons for their breakup are unknown to me, but I can only imagine the loyalty of two cheaters to each other. She may have asked him to count to eleven with his hands behind his back. I called Laura the charming police officer who served the search warrant, and asked her out on a date. She kindly declined, but advised me to contact her older sister Adrienne, who worked as a lawyer's secretary and loved to dress up in a Batgirl costume for Halloween. Our first date was a delightful surprise. We became close because of our shared love for the three jellies, Pee Wee Herman and Jim Carrey. We also found that we like operas, we both agreed that we were the strangest couple on the planet and believed that fate had brought us together. Dressed as Emma Peel from the Avengers in an elegant black patent leather swimsuit, Adriana and I went to Comic-Con, where I decided to propose to her. I couldn't risk dressing Zorro because of a previous incident when I attacked my ex-wife's lover and we were accompanied by Adriana's sister, who was a police officer. Despite the fact that Laura suggested that I dress up as Zorro, I pretended to be a fool and ignored her offer. A year later, Adriana and I tied the knot at Comic-Con, 
wearing Batman and Batgirl costumes on our special day. My sons were dressed as the Joker and the Riddler, and Adriana's sister Laura, who now worked as a detective, was dressed as Catwoman at the fifth wedding anniversary celebration. During the party, Laura called me aside and said that the statute of limitations had passed, and I can admit that on that Halloween night I painted the letter Z on my forehead. I confessed that it was me, a daring renegade with a black magic marker. In response, she smiled the biggest smile I've ever seen. Then it seemed that everyone in the city was constantly talking about it. She walked over to her husband, who was talking animatedly with Adriana. After hugging her husband, Laura warned him to stop flirting with Zorro's wife. He looked puzzled, but my wife, who knew the whole story, nodded in agreement with her sister. A week later, Laura appeared on our doorstep with a box containing a new black raincoat, hat, mask, and a Damascus whip. Now I only wore a cape and a mask when I was making love to my wife. In the midst of the process, Adriana took off my mask and, crossing herself, exclaimed in mock amazement, Santa Maria, you really are Don Diego! The past year has been incredibly difficult for me for a number of reasons. I was in the process of preparing to transfer my family's construction business from my father, who unfortunately passed away from a sudden heart attack at the beginning of the year. Shortly after his death, I received news that my wife was leaving me. I distinctly remember a phone call from my mother, who informed me about my father's heart attack when I was on a business trip. Despite the fact that I was madly rushing to the hospital, I arrived too late to say goodbye to him. After the funeral, I took on a new role in the family business, taking on more responsibility and learning the ins and outs of the job. When I focused on work, my relationship with my wife Angela began to deteriorate. She felt lonely, and I tried to reassure her that it was temporary. But Angela sought solace elsewhere, turning to Stephen Collins to fill the void in her life. When she announced that she was leaving me, it was like a stab to the heart. I couldn't believe it. Why? I asked, realizing the difficulties we faced together but her answer pierced me to the core. You've never been around, she confessed. I crossed paths with Stephen and we got together. I'm sorry, Dave, but he was there for me when you weren't there. I fell in love with him. With a heavy heart, Angela headed for the door. I'll be back as soon as you pack up and move out. As I watched her leave, the woman I adored, tall and slender with flowing brown curls, disappeared from my life. I was stunned by the news that Angela brought me. Looking at the divorce papers on the table, in which she demanded the house, custody of our daughter Millie, 30% of our savings and alimony, I realized that I had to make a decision. After collecting my clothes and personal belongings, I left and spent the weekend at the hotel trying to figure everything out. The following week, I found a small three-bedroom house on a quiet street to rent for permanent residence. At work, I kept the news of the impending divorce to myself, knowing that my colleagues would find out about it sooner or later. I just wasn't ready to discuss it with anyone yet. Collins owned a chain of stores selling building materials and was our main supplier. The romance between them was a mystery to me, but I turned out to be indifferent to the details. I was completely confident in the safety of the company because we had a reliable contract with Prynne. My father insisted on it to ensure the protection of the business in the event of my divorce from Angela. Although we both signed the agreement believing that we would be together forever, I was most worried about our daughter Millie. I was determined not to harm her because of the dissolution of our marriage. Angela got the house and alimony, and I was calm for my daughter. Spousal support was provided but on condition that she did not remarry. A year after the divorce, she married Stephen Collins, and they moved into the house that I gave her. Angela was given custody of Millie, and at first I saw her twice a month on weekends, but over time, the dates became less frequent and were planned based on their convenience, not mine. Despite my attempts to contact them, 
There were always excuses why I couldn't spend time with Millie on weekends. In the end, I decided to wait for them to decide for themselves when I could see Millie, and stop trying to make plans. I didn't understand it at the time, but Angela caused a rift between me and my daughter. What really angered me was that Collins was bragging about his family and belittling me at the same time. Angela's act and my daughter's absence weighed heavily on me. When I found out that her disrespectful husband was humiliating me, I felt nothing but contempt for them. I was looking forward to the weekend when Millie would be with me. On Saturday morning, she asked me a question and called me Uncle Dave. I corrected her by saying that I was actually her father. She insisted that Stephen was her dad, and Mom told her that I was her uncle. It upset me terribly, but I didn't say anything to Angela when she picked up Millie on Sunday. I didn't want to argue in front of Millie. I decided to bring this up the next time we're alone. After a hard day at work, I snapped and realized that I had been condescending to her for too long. The next day, I began to implement my revenge plan. During the week, I devoted a significant part of my time to communicating with existing and potential suppliers. I promised them business expansion in exchange for competitive prices. Many of them agreed with this idea, looking forward to the opportunity to expand their cooperation with us. Then I gathered top managers, as well as heads of purchasing and accounting departments, for a meeting. When I entered the room, I felt tension in the air. I assured them that the company was not in danger, and immediately reassured them. Gentlemen, I want to consider all the issues that may concern you, I began, causing a noticeable sigh of relief among those present. I know that the company is currently working on several projects. I'm interested to know how many of these projects still need building materials. Don Foster, in charge of procurement, responded quickly. He mentioned that two facility managers had asked to place large orders this week. I gave Don an updated list of our suppliers, stressing that all orders must come through them. Don noticed that Collins Construction Supplies was not included in the list, and brought this to my attention. Harrington Construction will no longer do business with CCS. All orders placed with them will be cancelled immediately. Employees who purchase at least one nail or screw from CCS will be fired. There are companies in the list that can provide us with the necessary products, and they all offered competitive prices and timely delivery. The rest of the meeting was spent discussing various business issues. Two weeks after the meeting, the company successfully signed a contract for the construction of numerous houses and retail outlets in their immediate vicinity. The project required a significant number of materials. Despite this, CCS did not receive orders from the project. The news of winning the contract spread quickly, and soon the CCS seller contacted us. The seller offered to provide all the necessary materials at a reasonable price, but I interrupted his sentence to inform him that we no longer use CSS as a provider. When he came out of my office, his expression was clearly shocked. I couldn't help but smile, which didn't go unnoticed by Sandra, my secretary. I see you liked it, she said with a smile. I understood perfectly well why she said that. Since I mentioned that we would no longer be dealing with CCS, things have gone up the hill. Our new suppliers kept their promises, and small projects were constantly coming to us. One major opportunity came when I was asked to apply to build a new headquarters for a growing technology company, and we won it. But against the background of all these successes, the year also brought a sad moment. My mother's health deteriorated, and she passed away. The divorce and the reduction of contacts with Millie only aggravated the pain of losing her father. Angela, who was aware of the situation, did not even bother to express her condolences or attend the funeral. The lack of support from her disappointed me. In addition, when I was asked why I decided not to work with CCS anymore, I honestly talked about the actions of the owner who stole my family from me. It may seem like a small thing, but severing ties with his company was my way of getting justice and retribution without going to jail. Soon, one of my managers, Bill, came up to me and wanted to talk to me. 
He mentioned that some of our smaller competitors and subcontractors had stopped cooperating with CCS. Bill, who is a Freemason, learned at a recent lodge meeting that both Baxter's and Charlesworth Construction were among those who no longer purchase materials from CCS. It turned out that rumors about this had spread in the industry. Bill also noted that many people treat me with great respect, which I probably didn't know. I appreciate your kind words about my personality and honesty in business dealings, Bill. It is very important for me to be considered a decent person. My father has put a lot of effort into creating a positive image for our business, and I try to maintain that reputation. Despite the success of my business, I realized that I had not spent time with my daughter for a long time. I decided to call Angela and see if I could take Millie for the weekend. As soon as I got home, the doorbell rang and Angela burst in. Good evening, Angela. I greeted her. Please come in. She greeted me sarcastically. Don't look so smug at me, Dave. What are you up to? What's going on, Angela? We haven't talked in ages. And now you come here and accuse me of who knows what. You know exactly what I'm talking about, she screamed. You're trying to disrupt Stephen's business. Not only do you no longer want to work with him, but it's just disgusting to spread rumors about him in other companies. I realized that Angela was very angry because in a short period of time she cursed me twice. I didn't mention our situation, Angela. Most people know about what happened between you, me, and Stephen. If they chose to go somewhere else, it's not my fault. If you have nothing else to say, please leave. I haven't eaten yet, but I'm hungry. When she left, I closed the door and chuckled to myself. I was pleased to learn that Collins is experiencing some difficulties. After finishing the meal, I called Angela and asked her to pick up Millie for the weekend. Despite her pent-up anger, she eventually agreed and brought Millie home on Saturday morning. We spent the day at the zoo, and on the way home we stopped for hamburgers. I asked her about her progress at school, to which she replied positively. She mentioned that her mom wanted her to go to another school, but she is happy to be with her friends at the current school. Later in the evening we watched a movie, after which Millie went to bed just after 9 in the evening. Reflecting on her statements about changing schools, I thought about the consequences. After dropping Millie off at home on Sunday, Angela called me in for a conversation while Stephen was away, and Millie went to her room. Dave, I hate to ask this, but is there any way you can assign an order to Stephen? Angela pleaded. We were hoping to send Millie to a private girls' school, but our finances collapsed. I'm sorry, Angela, but we're busy with existing projects right now. I lied knowing full well that no new projects were in sight. Besides, Millie seems to be happy with her current school and her circle of friends. It seems that she has no desire to transfer to another school. The journey home was pleasant for me. I knew that CCS was experiencing financial difficulties and would most likely close soon if it did not find new customers. Collins closed two of its branches, leaving only the main shipyard and the head office. It was hard for me to hide my amusement when I informed Angela that we had no new orders, although in fact there was more work than ever. It was nice to know that she and Steve were having difficulties. My main focus was on Millie, an innocent man caught in the middle of all this chaos. It was only a few months later that Don Foster broke the news to me that CCS had gone bankrupt. The school holidays were approaching, and I saw this as an opportunity to spend time with Millie. Angela seemed relieved to be temporarily distracted from her work. For the first time in many years, I took a vacation. Millie and I went on a two-week trip to Florida, visited Disneyland and other attractions. By the end of the two-week trip, I was exhausted, but satisfied. I was completely unaware of what was going on at home, as there was not a single phone call, which indicated that everything should have been going well. When we finally got home late, Millie went straight to bed. I busied myself unpacking things from our luggage and then joined her in bed. The next morning we had breakfast and then went to Angela's. Angela looked a little sullen, but listened patiently while Millie talked about our vacation adventures. I casually inquired about Stephen's whereabouts, to which Angela replied, I have no idea, Dave. He asked me to mortgage the house to save his business. 
After my refusal, he left angrily and has not returned since. It's been two days now, and there's no connection from him. I said goodbye and went home to sort out some business before returning to work on Monday. Angela called me in the middle of the morning on Monday and asked for advice on what to do with the missing Stephen and some issues that need attention in order to sell the business. I advised that if she is not a director and the house is not connected with the business, then she should not interfere. It was Stephen's responsibility, not hers. I offered Millie to stay with me to help her, but she politely declined and thanked me anyway. Sandra noticed my smile and jokingly remarked that I seemed to be enjoying the CCS drop. As for me, I don't care what happens to him and Angela. I'm most worried about Millie. Fortunately, Angela accepted my offer to help with Millie and stayed with me for a few weeks. As a father, I made sure Millie arrived at school on time and picked her up too. This was a convenient advantage for the authorities. I was sure that the managers in the office would be able to do without me for several hours every day. I liked talking to my daughter, knowing that Angela was going through Stephen's absence hard. She forwarded all the mail for him to the lawyer who handled his business matters. Without receiving financial support from Stephen, Angela was thinking about finding a job to pay the bills. She hasn't contacted me, but even if she had, I would have refused. Stephen disappeared without a trace, and his lawyer took care of his business matters. One of the small companies I worked with needed a new headquarters for the business. As a result, they bought the CCS shipyard at a very low price. Angela decided to divorce Stephen because he left her and sold the house to move into a smaller apartment. She gave all of Stephen's clothes to a charity for the homeless. Millie was happy in her new home because she had a large bedroom. Angela found a job as an administrative assistant at a small law firm. At the same time, my business expanded and I gained financial stability for the future. Angela showed signs of stress. She was aging rapidly, probably due to the fact that she had to manage Stephen's business and cope with his sudden disappearance. Our communication has expanded, which has allowed me to spend more time with Millie. But it is not possible to resume a romantic relationship with Angela since I made it clear that the ship had sailed. Despite Sandra's attempts to set me up with her niece, I remained single. My goal of getting justice for my family was achieved because I successfully exposed the person responsible for their suffering. Now I can sleep peacefully at night, knowing that I have fulfilled my mission. I can't help but wonder if Stephen Collins can say the same thing wherever he is.